Good morgen. <laughs> det är en uh, ära att vara här. <laughs> I'll do the rest in English. <laughs> I have no conflicts of interest. Uh, views are my own. Um, yes, I uh, am a public health official over about a million people in my area. Um, when I saw what was going on, I got involved and got elected to our health board. If everybody is thinking alike, then somebody isn't thinking. This is one of my favorite quotes from Mark Twain. The man who does not read has no advantage over the man who cannot read. And this is a problem we've had in medicine over these couple of years. We have colleagues like Dr. Mulhotra mentioned who get their information from the mainstream media, including Rochelle Walensky, the director of our CDC. She was getting her vaccine information from CNN. And how many people in the room have heard of the Trusted News Initiative? Show of hands. Okay, about 20, 30%. If you don't know about the Trusted News Initiative, please look that up and you will understand why the message we've been getting around the world has been uniform, lockstep, and very restricted. BBC, AP, French News, um, New York Times, Washington Post, Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. You will understand why you aren't getting this information. And everything you want is on the other side of fear. All right, this one's interesting. The FDA protects the big drug companies and is subsequently rewarded and using the government's police powers, they attack those who threaten the big drug companies. People think that the FDA is protecting them. It isn't. What the FDA is doing and what the public thinks it is doing are as different as night and day. Now, that's a fascinating thought. But what's even more fascinating is what we are experiencing is not new. This was from Dr. Herbert Lay, the former commissioner of the US FDA in 1969. What we're experiencing now has been going on for a long time. But what's different is we are now awake. All right, in order to understand modernity, we must understand history. And where we are now is obviously different from where we have been, but if we don't look to the past, we won't realize the things that have been done wrong and we can't advance going forward. How many people remember when you were a child, you were curious? You wanted to learn things, see things, big, small. The mind was a playground. Everything was new. Well, unfortunately, we're now encouraging children to memorize this, that, everything is an algorithm instead of creativity. Some people die at 25 when they stop learning, but aren't buried until they're 85. The moment you stop learning is the moment you die. So keep that curiosity. Unfortunately, this is the attitude of much of medicine now whatever, I'm gonna put it on my socials. But that intellectual curiosity, the rigor is missing in much of medicine. Our profession has gone awry and people get so busy just in their day to day that they don't look at the bigger picture and don't use that curious mind and that critical mind like Dr. Malhotra, stepping outside that box and looking at what's going on behind the scenes. This is what you know. And this is what you still need to learn. And this is the same for my colleagues. This is the same for me. The more you know, the less you know. And it's so critical to maintain that humility in science and medicine if medicine is truly going to advance. Now, I'm a pathologist. A pathologist is the most important doctor that you never meet that you always hope is correct. 
So I see lots of people every day, a piece of them, under my microscope, a biopsy, but they never see me. But my job is to get the quiz, the test, a score of 100% every day. When a patient passes away, historically, we learned from the dead. They taught us. They showed us what was wrong so we could do better the next time. And we honor those. Unfortunately, during these last three years, agencies around the world have said, don't do autopsies. The only reason not to do them is because you don't want to know. And that does not honor those who have passed. So let's look through this lens of scrutiny. We took an, an oath in medicine, and when I took this oath, primum non nocere, first do no harm, it wasn't to an administrator, it was not to a hospital, it was not to a government bureaucrat or agency. It was a sacred oath to a patient. And the profession of medicine must remember this, that that's the sacred relationship, physician to patient. And what is an oath? A solemn formal declaration or promise to fulfill a pledge, often calling on God, a God, or a sacred object as a witness. What's happened to the oath of a profession that was once noble? Is it now just technocratic? And this is so important that we go back to the meaning of things. An oath means something. A patient is sacred to me. My relationship with that patient should have no one else interfering. And it's just not physical harm. One needs to remember to do no harm means to not do physical harm, certainly. But what about psychological harm? What about financial harm? And to do harm isn't just to do something to a patient, but sometimes it's to omit doing something, leaving out what you could have done. Early treatment during these last couple of years with early treatment medications. Omitting what you could have done. Oh, you're fine, go home. When your lips are blue, then you can come back to the hospital. No, we always treat the patient. We don't tell them to wait and see if they're gonna make it. Let's put medicine under that lens of scrutiny. And has medicine crossed the line? There's a red line. The bottom right, noble profession. Upper left, is it now about the money? Is it now about the power? Have we crossed that line? The ability to question is freedom. The inability to do so is just the opposite. It's servitude, it's shackles, it's chains, it's communism. You are free when you are allowed to ask a question without fear of retribution. Now, I've shared science and truth over the last several years. I've almost completely lost my practice. I've been attacked from multiple agencies. Um, but I won't stop because it isn't about me. It isn't about power. It isn't about money. For me, it's about humanity. And I will always ask the question and I will always speak freely. And of course, all scientists agree when you censor the ones who don't. <laughs> Again, what has happened to a noble profession? Let's put them under this lens. They have crossed the line when they have silenced critical thinking physicians, healthcare providers, health freedom activists. It is our job to protect humanity together. Public health. Public health should not be about treatment. It should be about education and prevention. Simple as that. That's public health. We don't have a health care system around the world in most places. We have a sick care system. If we had a health care system, we wouldn't need the sick care system. Basic messages that have been left out over the last couple of years. On your advertisements on TV, or in your schools, or at your workplace, did you hear these things? Get your vitamin D. 
vitamin D, vitamin D, vitamin D, certainly some magnesium and vitamin K2. Lose weight, like Dr. Malhotra said. Lose weight, cut the sugar. What about the inflammatory industrial oils that are consumed in the world now? Canola oil, grapeseed oil, rapeseed oil, soybean oil. It's in everything that's a processed food now. Those inflame your body. What about exercise? What about sleep? The more you sleep an adequate amount, the stickier your immune cells are. They talk to each other. They function better. What about a prayer practice or a meditation practice? What about going outside? In nature, there are studies, uh, Shinin Roku in Japan, walking in the forest, bathing in the forest, will stimulate your T cells. There are medical studies that show this. Are you walking in the woods? Are you getting outside? What about being in community? The best cure for depression is to be together in community. And then having treatments on hand, be prepared. Be your own best doctor. Don't be dependent on somebody else when you can take care of the things that you can take care of. Now, here in the northern countries, in Scandinavia, and where I live in, in the northern United States, at this time of year, above the 35th uh, latitude, you can't synthesize vitamin D for the rest of winter. So if you are not taking vitamin D right now in this room, and safe dose for anyone in this room is 100 micrograms, 4,000 international units, without ever even getting a blood test. If you don't, oops, other direction. Uh-oh, I did something wrong, there we go. If you don't, <laughs> You can run outside naked for the rest of winter and you will make zero vitamin D, none. So you need to take vitamin D, why? It's the conductor of the symphony of your immune system. It helps the genes turn on and off. All of your white blood cells have a vitamin D receptor. But if you don't take it, your immune system is the mosh pit at a punk rock concert. This paper came out four days ago. Decreased high-risk morbidity and mortality by almost 30% during the pandemic. Other papers before the pandemic, th there's really no such thing as a flu and a cold season. There's low vitamin D season. When is flu and cold season? Fall and winter. Why? Your vitamin D is low. This should be a basic public health message. Dr. Martineau did this study and showed many years ago, about five years ago when he published this, it decreased respiratory infections by half, decreased the severity by half. Who's at risk? Well, everybody in a northern climate, but certainly the elderly, especially those in care homes, and the darker your skin, the farther north you live, the more vitamin D you need, because pigment in the skin is a sunscreen, a natural sunscreen. And then obesity. The more weight one carries on their body, your vitamin D gets stored there. And then you need more to get into circulation. Basic public health. If you want to empty the hospitals, RSV season, influenza season, hopefully not SARS-CoV-3 season in the future, but Whatever one does affects the big system as well. So if we want to unburden the system, public health officials need to teach public health. What about this poison? It's in so many things, high fructose corn syrup. It is an empty calorie that harms your body. But in the United States, 70 to 80% of the food in the grocery stores has high fructose corn syrup in it it literally inactivates your vitamin D. It is an immune suppressant in processed foods. Blood sugar, the one factor, there was an AI algorithm that was performed looking at all the papers written on COVID and the one factor that predicted bad outcomes was sugar, the word sugar or glucose. What was the blood sugar? That was the one factor Certainly, it goes along with obesity and other underlying conditions, but this is the poison. I, I don't get me wrong, I love my sweets. I try to do more dark chocolate than anything. Exercise. 
Okay, here we are in the Northland. I'm not saying you have to look like that and go to the gym every day. But it is a fantastic idea to get outside and move your body. So locking people down and closing the gyms was just the opposite of what public health should have done. Again, you don't need an intense exercise program, but what you do need is to move. That stimulates your immune system. And there are papers on this, large cohort studies looking back at the pandemic, showing if this had been done, we would have decreased hospitalizations by high percentages. Basic public health. Insulin resistance, I know Dr. Malhotra touched on that, and that's one of his areas of specialty. So much of the world, because of the little bit of extra dad bod or mom bod we're carrying, we don't process insulin right, and then we build up fat, and then that affects our blood vessels, it affects our heart, it affects our overall wellness. And again, adiposity, obesity, one of the highest risk factors for bad outcomes in COVID, but not just for COVID, because fat releases a cytokine called interleukin-6. The more adipose we carry, the more inflamed we are from the start before any infection. So by decreasing our weight in whatever pleasant way you can do it, like Dr. Malhotra, I eat a low carb diet and I move my body. So this is what we need, need to change. And this is happening more and more and more around the world. We certainly have a medical industrial complex but as the big corporations take over the food systems, we also have an agricultural industrial complex and their interest is not your health, their interest is their profits. This is what we need to be thinking about. Does your plate look like that? And yes, that's me fishing in Alaska. And those are my lambs and my cows, I raise my own food. So I know where my food comes from and it's all organic, no pesticides, no chemicals. But this is how much of the world is starting to eat. Quick, convenient, empty calories that is shortening our lives. Is public health teaching us this? Or do they make it more and more and more available? If you had that nice car there, would you put sand in that fuel tank? No, of course you wouldn't. But that's what we do over a lifetime. We put things into our bodies that make our car look more like the jalopy on the left, or on the right, I'm sorry. Under the lens of scrutiny, here we are again. Has medicine crossed the line? Yes, it has. It isn't teaching these basic principles. Trust in public health, it's bruised and broken, especially after these last three years, the propaganda. The misinformation, the disinformation has actually come mostly from the public health officials. That's the frustration. And then they accuse us of doing so when we're trying to share basic physiologic scientific principle. Informed consent, Dr. Malhotra talked about this. There is the insert from one of the vaccine vials. That is not informed consent. Don't lie. Like I said, Walensky, our CDC director in the US, admitted to lying about data and admitted she was getting her data from the news media. That is not a competent physician. And then what did our public health officials tell us? We did things like this, and this, and this. Oh, and then thankfully we're all smart enough to know that when we go into a restaurant, the virus doesn't know when we're sitting down. But this says it all. How well do they work? Well, you live in a cold country in the winter. See that vapor? They don't work. But again, public health continues to force things around the world that doesn't make sense. When the basic things, put on a mask, no, lose, lose 20 kilos. That, that'll improve your health and save you more than a mask ever will. Under the lens of scrutiny, they've crossed the line. They've crossed that red line. They've messed up. What about these vac vaccines, gene-based injections? I don't call them a vaccine because they're not a traditional vaccine.
And why? Well, let's see. Do they prevent disease? No. Do they prevent you from acquiring the virus? No. Do they prevent you from transmitting or spreading the virus? No. Do they keep you from getting sick? No. And in sad cases, do they keep you from passing away? No. Is that a vaccine? No. <laughs> Common sense. And how did they fail us? We trust these federal regulatory health agencies to do their job. But they're captured by big money. They are captured. In the United States, our FDA, almost half of their funding comes from pharmaceutical companies. Our CDC owns the patent on 58 vaccines and makes almost $6 billion a year in royalty from those patents. Are they protecting our health? No. No. What were they supposed to do on a gene-based injection? Biodistribution. Where in the body does this thing go? Toxicology. Fertility studies, reproductive studies, mutation studies, dose-dependent studies, long-term studies. Did they do any of that? No. And then, in order to get this across the line, they changed the definition of the vaccine very sneakily. It doesn't have to provide immunity, just, quote, protection. So, if you play George Orwell and word games and newspeak, you can create your new, new language and then get away with anything. And Orwell was a warning. Orwell was a warning. It wasn't an instruction manual. 1984 was not an instruction manual. They're using it as such. Safe and effective? Absolutely not. So, <laughs> here's, here's the problem. So, Coronavirus, I did PhD work in virology and immunology. Coronaviruses are a family of virus that always mutate. And you go to that arcade game and that little mole pops up and you try to hit it and then the next one pops up and you try to hit it. You can never keep up with the mutation rate of a coronavirus. As we have learned, but as those of us who knew warned from day one when they said, we're going to make a coronavirus vaccine. And I said, oh, no, you aren't. But they did, and they said, it's going to be great. And I said, no, it's not, and it wasn't. And yeah, it's about as effective as trying to pick a booger through a mask. Thanks, Dr. Fauci, for posing for that one. <laughs> it's like chase, a dog chasing its tail, trying to keep up with the coronavirus. And then our, um, one of our healthcare, I don't even want to call her a professional, but in 2020, she said, this is one of the most highly effective vaccines we have in our infectious disease arsenal. And then this summer, she said, oh, I knew these vaccines were not going to protect against infection, and I think we overplayed the vaccines. She was advising Trump. She lied. We shouldn't accept public health officials that lie. Their job is to protect us. Okie dokie. Logic. If your vaccine doesn't protect you, how is my vaccine going to protect you? Very simple. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And this doesn't need to be our new healthcare system, a Pfizer loyalty card. Okay. And then this is the one that I, I just scratched my head at this one. You know, oh, you know, I, I live a clean life. You know, I eat non-GMO foods and hippy-dippy and gosh, you know, mother nature. And then everybody goes and gets a synthetic GMO stuck into their arm. <laughs> and this is sad to keep a job. This is not a choice. This is coercion. And this is a bridge to disaster if we allow these public health policies to continue. And again, informed consent. There was not the opportunity. There was the opportunity, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Informed consent has gone away. And we need to bring that back to all of medicine. Under the lens of scrutiny, again, thank you. Again, they fail. They have crossed the red line. Science gone rogue. So they tell you, 
oh, we're going to take a gene and a lipid nanoparticle, put it into your body, it will go into your cells, your cell will now become the factory for a protein that is foreign in your body that will distribute throughout your body now. They said it's going to stay in your arm, right? Here's a needle in the muscle in your arm. But look, that vessel is torn apart, those lipid nanoparticles. Certainly, this is spike protein in the muscle of the arm. Certainly, it makes some spike protein in the cells there. And now these cells get attacked by your immune system, but it doesn't stay there, and I'll get to that in a minute. The spike protein persists. So early on at Harvard, a study was done showing that spike protein. So with, a, with, with traditional vaccines, usually you'll see injury within the first few weeks after a protein and an adjuvant are injected. This is a gene product. So they said, oh, it's safe, it's effective. Anything that happens after a couple days isn't injury from the shot. That's a lie. As a pathologist, virologist, immunologist, I know that's a lie, and I'm going to show you why. So at Harvard, they showed that it was in circulation for up to a month. At Stanford, Dr. Rolkin's study showed that it was present for at least two months, not just the spike protein, but the gene, the mRNA, the gene was still present in the cells because they made it synthetic with something called pseudouridine. They stopped it two months so they could publish their paper. We don't have a paper showing how long it persisted at least two months. And then there's a paper by Dr. Bonsall in the Journal of Immunology. Spike protein circulating in exosomes in the body for at least four months. Here's a problem. A lipid nanoparticle plus an mRNA gene sequence of any sort, not just COVID, because all these pharmaceutical companies now think they have carte blanche to go ahead and use this platform for RSV, influenza, HIV, tuberculosis, anything. They have a bunch of these on the stovetop they're cooking right now. A lipid nanoparticle goes everywhere and anywhere in the body, to the brain, to the bone marrow, to the spleen, to the liver, to the reproductive organs. Your cells were not to, meant to be the factory for a foreign protein and your body will attack the cells that are making a foreign protein. And a study just came out last week, 80% of people have, that have had um, long COVID or vaccine injury have anti-idiotype antibodies. That means antibodies that are attacking yourself because your cells were never meant to be a factory for a foreign protein. Under the lens of scrutiny, they have crossed the red line. Omicron, okay, the virus always mutates and changes, and up there in the orange, that's Omicron. And as you can see, it doesn't branch off from alpha, gamma, delta, lambda, the other variants. It's on a different family tree. So which spike are we treating with these shots? Extinct spikes. Wuhan went extinct in humanity over a year and a half ago. The BA4 and the BA5 that they made the shots for with the bivalence are almost gone now too. Why would you give a shot for something that's extinct? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. And in a few months, it's gonna be a different variant anyway. Whack-a-mole. So there's Omicron. It's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's the funny uncle that doesn't belong in the family tree. Yeah, the milkman or postman came along, and uh, who knows? <laughs> but it, it, it's, I call it cold vid, not COVID now. Omicron is a cold for most people. But unfortunately, the shots have suppressed the immune system. And those who continue to get shot three, four, five, I'm not here to judge. If you got a shot, I'm not here to judge. I'm just saying it's cumulative. The spike persists for a long time. If you got one shot, don't get two. If you got two, don't get a third. If you got three, don't get a fourth. Just stop, okay? I'm not here to judge. <laughs> and in the studies for the bivalent boosters that are out, what happened to the mice? Now, they didn't test it on humans because they did it only on mice because they broke all the regulatory rules. But what happened to all the mice in the study? 
all of them, they all still had COVID, and yet all the agencies in the world still approved this bivalent booster, even though every animal still had the disease, because it's not a vaccine. And when does the body stop making the spike protein? Where are the medical studies that show it's done producing? I don't know, man, I just don't know. <laughs> Under the lens of scrutiny, again, they have crossed the line and they have failed. All right, what does the spike do? The spike is not your friend from the virus and or, and or the shots, both. It alters your innate immune system. That's the Marines of your blood. You have 30 billion T cells circulating right now. They are your army fighting off everything, cancer, infections. It alters that. It puts a lot of those T cells to sleep. It damages your blood vessel. It causes clotting and it causes heart inflammation. Mitochondria, that's the engine of every cell in your body. You have tons of mitochondria in every cell. It inhibits and destroys those. It causes neurologic damage. The spike protein crosses into the brain. We have put a product into the bodies of people that makes a toxin that can go to the brain. Anybody hear about brain fog? Of course. It can cause organ damage, viral reactivation, attack on your cells, immune in imprinting, meaning if you keep getting this spike protein in the future, your body is like a horse with blinders on and it won't be able to see other variants. It's narrowing your memory. It's imprinting you to right now, and you want a broad immune response in your lifetime. And guess what? The higher your vitamin D level is, the better breadth of memory and immunity your body has to any and every infection. Simple as that, public health message. Reproductive harms, inability for your DNA to repair itself, autoimmune disease, cancer gene binding, interferon suppression, interferon. Why are we seeing so many children in the hospital now with influenza and RSV? Well, so many countries have forced their children to get these shots. Interferon goes up when you want to fight off viruses or cancer. These shots suppress it. Okay, I'm gonna go through these very quickly because I don't want you to think, oh, he's just saying stuff. This is the medical literature harms the blood vessels, harms the DNA, harms the mitochondria. Dr. Gundry's paper that Dr. Malhotra mentioned increases cardiac risk because it's harming the blood vessels. Immune imprinting. This is the study showing 60 days later the sequence and the spike is still present in the body in a high percentage of individuals out of Stanford, Dr. Volkin's study alters the marines of your immune system, puts them to sleep, makes them drunk, they go back to the bar barracks. They had 750 milliliters of aquavit and they can't move. And RSV reactivated, microRNAs uh, suppressing the immune system, down-regulating toll-like receptors. This is very important. These are little pattern recognition receptors in your body. And what happens? These need to be in balance in order to fight off other viruses and cancer. The shot suppresses and alters them. Herpes zoster, tons of new viral outbreaks because of the immune suppression from these shots and the downregulation of receptors. Kidney damage, liver damage, heart damage, metabolism damage, um, lung damage, liver damage, um, let's see, da -da -da -da, heart damage in children. So in Thailand, they did a very good study and they showed that 29% of children after their second shot, a study of about 300 children, 29% of them had one, at least one cardiac manifestation after that shot. One third, that's what we're going to do to our children? Not all of it was myocarditis or pericarditis, that was about one in 50, but still that's shocking. Would you take two classrooms of children out of a school and say, I'm gonna give that kid heart disease for life? Of course you wouldn't. Um, reactivation of mononucleosis, Epstein-Barr virus. Um, reduction of T cells, exhausting T cells, impairing T cells, impairing T cells, impairing T cells, making your body unable to repair its own DNA. Right now you have atypical cells in your body. You've got little rips and tears in cells. 
Your immune system comes along and says, oh, we need to zipper that back. Let's just close it back up. So your body can do that. But if you get this spike protein into the nucleus of your cell, it can't do that anymore. And these, these are studies that have been done. But what's interesting is a university will do one or two of these studies and then stop. Where are the follow-up studies? I will tell you where they are. Missing. Why? Because they published something that was threatening to the narrative and the corporations and the bureaucracies. And they don't want to lose their research funding and do another study. Um, more, oh, community, more immune system exhaustion and dropping, more vaccine injury, blah, 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 blah. Crossing into the brain. We know the spike protein goes into the brain. This is the, this is the most important one. How many people have heard about chronic fatigue after the shots? Yeah, a lot of chronic fatigue. Part of that can be Epstein-Barr virus. In the injured patients, I've seen about half of them with reactivated Epstein-Barr virus. But your mitochondria being damaged is another really critical aspect of what's happening. And there are, there are ways to treat, and there are plenty of other lectures, and we've talked about putting out some um, information on some of our websites to assist people that are unfortunately experiencing some of these things. Uh, mitochondrial damage, metabolic damage in the brain, you know, no problem, get a shot, ruin your brain, man, no problem. Uh, damage in the heart, oh, what about female fertility? Oh, these are safe and effective, nothing to worry about. These are not the droids you're looking for, said Obi-Wan Kenobi. But these are the droids you're looking for. The spike protein goes to the ovary, the lipid nanoparticle concentrates in the ovaries. And what about in men? Oh, I'm going to skip that one. Oh, we'll get to that one. Uh, what about reverse transcribing into your own DNA? Well, in Sweden, they did a study. They showed that it did. And who's doing the studies to look at it in humans and in the organs? A couple of us out of our own back pocket because the universities aren't doing it. Uh, menstrual cycle irregularities. Anybody heard of a woman having irregular bleeding after the shots? Oh, yeah. It's real. And then impairing sperm motility for six months. And sperm counts for six months. Study out of Israel in the ovary. And then, hmm, what's happening to the birth rates? Oh, that got cut off, darn. Well, birth rates, Germany, Sweden, Taiwan, China, down 20% in 2022 in some of those countries. 20%. Safe and effective. What kind of effective are they looking for? Under the lens of scrutiny. Oh, I see, they are safe and effective. Yeah, under that lens, I'll be darned. Hmm. Yep. And why would we put a shot that makes the cells of the body make a harmful spike protein into anybody at this point, especially a child? These just need to be stopped everywhere. And this platform, lipid nanoparticle mRNA, needs to never be used again. Because children are not lab rats. <laughs> the line's been crossed. Science gone rogue. Science has gone rogue. And I think, oh man, boy, did I just jump back. Oh, OK, now we're going to go forward. You don't have to believe me, because the cells do not lie. I'm a pathologist. I'm a nerd. I get to do this all day long, look at these things, fun patterns. That's heart muscle. All those blue dots is inflammation in the heart from the spike protein. How do we know? We can do studies in the lab. This is a heart attack. On the left, all that brown, that's the spike protein in heart muscle. Every pathology lab in the world should be doing this on every death because we can prove it. And we use a control. If it were the virus on the right, we would see the interior parts of the virus. We don't. We see the spike protein. And it's in the brain, spike protein, and in the blood vessels, spike protein, and in the brain, spike protein, and da -da -da, in the aorta, 
inflammation in the aorta, an aorta that ripped open and the patient died. In the spleen, it goes everywhere. And that reactivates these other infections in the human body, all these other viruses that we're seeing in increased numbers because of immune suppression, chicken pox, herpes, cytomegalovirus. Under the lens of scrutiny, this is a gene going into the cells of the body, making a protein. They have crossed the red line. Are we going to get the sanctity of medicine back? Are we going to put the patient or the corporation first? All right, now the clot thickens. And I meant to say that. The clot shot, because it is. It causes clotting in the body. And we've seen countless mechanisms. that These are unusual proteins that are being deposited in these clots. And a lot of people have microclots, and some have large clots. How many more minutes do I have? OK. Just like a seam, I'm going faster now. From the living, this patient lived. From those that didn't live, these are big clots. The spike protein causes this. Not in everybody, don't panic. But in a lot of people, it does. There are treatments, but they're hard to break down. They've put a clot shot into humanity. It doesn't pass the lens of scrutiny. They have crossed the red line. Uh-oh, monster in the room. Cancer. The spike protein binds to two cancer genes, P53 and BRCA. BRCA is the breast and ovarian cancer gene. P53 is the guardian of the genome. It's Gandalf. It keeps cancer from happening against the Balrog here. But when you put the spike protein into the body, those genes go dis become dysregulated. And everywhere I go, I talk to oncologists, radiologists, radiation oncologists, cancer surgeons, cancer, 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 in young patients because they're more metabolically active. And when you change all these pathways I mentioned, all of a sudden we have a problem. The government databases around the world have these codes in them. They are hiding them from us, and they are not updating them quickly enough. We're going to look back in two or three years and see the disaster we've created. Cancer trends, cancer trends, uh, cancer mechanisms. They put a dangerous protein in the bodies of humanity, billions of people, and it doesn't pass the lens of scrutiny. They cross the red line. What about sudden adult death syndrome? Let's see, it's your energy bill price that's causing it. That's what the media will tell you. No, you're shaking your duvet too hard. That's what's causing it. No, you moved your clock forward. That's what did it. No, um, eating breakfast at the wrong time, smoking too much pot, too much stress. Let's see, uh, cold weather can affect your body from winter vagina to blood clots. I don't know what winter vagina is, but I do know what blood clots are. Um, Canadians, you know, they're just shoveling too much snow, and that's what's causing heart attacks, or watching your sports team lose. That's what's causing all these heart attacks. Of course it's not. We need to ask for the autopsies. We can look for the spike protein in these tissues. We know what's causing it. It's the elephant in the room. And when an unapproved drug or therapy or vaccine is new and experimental, all adverse reactions and deaths should be considered to be caused by that agent until proven otherwise. We are currently looking the other way and doing just the opposite. What about new medical models? Remember the country physician that used to go visit the homes of people? It's not the physicians care. I have a lot of wonderful colleagues. Now, they've been brainwashed or snookered or duped into what's happened, but it doesn't mean they're not good people. They want something new. They're stuck in big systems. So we need to become more independent. We need to get the big interference out of the patient relationship with the physician. That's sacred. Independent medical research. As Dr. Mulhotra men mentioned, the drug companies shouldn't be able to review their own studies. They need to be reviewed independently. Uh, we need independent funding for a lot of research. Aga and I are working, are working on a women's health bleeding project. We need funding because the universities and the governments won't do it. So those who care or have experienced it, that's what we're trying to do. And that's how you get independent, honest medicine and research and data. 
the medical literature must not be owned and funded by the phar pharmaceutical companies and large corporations. A patient is not an economic unit. You are not a number, you are a human being. We must value and respect humanity again. We need to dialogue with our colleagues. This is many of us on this other side of this uh, pointing weapon here. We need, we need to bring, we need to be not afraid to ask questions. We need to have dialogue. And we need to look. One cannot find that for which they do not look. We need to demand that science looks when something is wrong and not look the other way. Education. The next generation is being prepared for blind compliance by teaching kids in schools to never ask questions, never criticize, and simply follow the rules. That is wrong. Critical thinking must be restored to education and medical education. You're not a statistic, you're a valuable human being. We need to build communities and connections. We re need to reconnect to the cycles of life and nature. We need to pursue art and hobby, and creativity, and humor. We need to be human. Earth without art is just eh. <laughs> we need family, we need connection, we need community. We need to be in groups, we need to learn from each other, we need to teach each other. Um, so tell me, Tony, are the variants in this room uh, with us right now? <laughs> I don't think he hangs around a whole lot of people based on his sociopathy. Be in nature, go to the farms. This is me and my daughter on my farm beekeeping. Regain the sovereignty of your mind. Is your body your own? Who owns your mind? Who guides your thoughts? Laughter is the best medicine. Be humorful, playful, silly. Under the lens of scrutiny, we need to change a lot of things. Red lines have been crossed. Celebrate independent health autonomy and those who choose for themselves. I did a little Christmas tree. You don't need a Christmas. If you're unvaccinated, your Christmas tree doesn't have needles, just balls. <laughs> And we need to not be like what much of medicine has become, <laughs> blinded. We need to stay awake like the ostrich on the right. Integrity is the distance between our lips and our actions. Act with integrity. Every word has consequences. Every silence does too. I've got two more slides. Silence in the face, oh, let's see, I'm gonna skip that one. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak, not to act is to act. We are here together today because we will all speak and do something. The opposite of love is not hate, it is indifference. The opposite of art is not ugliness, it is indifference. The opposite of faith is not heresy, it is indifference. And the opposite of life is not death, it is indifference. I prefer dangerous freedom over peaceful slavery. Thomas Jefferson, my six daughters and I say to you, Tusen Tak. Yeah.